taking time out of your busy days to spend a few minutes with us and let us bring you up to speed on what's new in our 11.1 .1 release. Uh, I can tell you that the actual 11.1 .1 release code has been posted as of this morning to our website and is available for download. Uh, and with that, let me kind of go into the agenda for our uh, meeting. Um, short introduction for everybody that's online and supporting the webcast this morning. And then we're going to really just dig in and walk through the features and changes that are new with the 11.1 .1 product set. Uh, amongst the most notable of those are our new web dashboard. Uh, since most everyone here is an existing user, you're familiar with our existing Windows-based uh, dashboard client that lets you uh, review and administer the functions of our various product stack. Uh, we've made a significant change to that in 11.1 .1 so that it's available across platform for a variety of uh, users in, in that we've made it a web enables dashboard so now you'll be able to see it through a web browser. Um, we've also added MRCP v2 SIP over TCP functionality which has been a requested enhancement for the product on the part of several of our customers. We've added a few changes to default behaviors that we want to call out so that as you move to the new uh, code version, you'll be aware of those and can make an intelligent choice for your particular environment about whether to accept the new bef default behavior or you'll whether you'll need to make a configuration change after installation to revert to an older behavior. And we've added some additional TTS voices in our uh, ever-growing stable of uh, voices from countries around the world. We'll have a Q&A session after the uh, presentation, and then we'll have a, a little bit of a conclusion uh, for you at the end. On the phone today, we have a, a couple of people from LemonVox, and I'll let Stephen advance that. We have Dave Rich, our CEO, listening in. Um, I'm here, Jeff Hopper, the Senior Director of Client Services. Uh, Nigel Quinnan, our Chief, Chief Information Officer, is with us and will be helping me answer questions in the uh, question queue. And Stephen Keller, a solutions architect, whom I think most of you know, will be uh, making the bulk of the presentation this morning. Mm -hmm. um, just a reminder, this discussion is only about the changes in 11.1 .1 and is intended for a technical, not a business audience. We assume that you have some familiarity with the existing LemonVox product suite. And we're going to particularly focus on the new features or changes to default behavior between 11.1 .1 and the most previous release, 11.0. Uh, and with that, I'll let uh, Stephen take over the actual presentation then. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Stephen Keller, as Jeff said. So just before we get into the features, uh, I want to remind everyone that the LumenVox release schedule that we're following here is that we release sort of what we would call important upgrades every uh, two to four times per year, roughly every quarter. Um, so the, our last um, big release was in late November, early December of last year. So this is going to be the, the first release in the 11, uh, well, the second release, I guess, in the 11 series, with 11.0 being the first, and this being 11.1. .1. And of course, we've always got the full release notes online in our knowledge base. And you can go ahead and click that link. We'll be sending everyone a copy of this presentation when we're done as well. Um, so you can click these links. Uh, as we talk, feel free to ask us questions. You can use the webinar questions panel to just shoot us a question. And uh, we'll have uh, Jeff there managing the question queue and making sure everything gets answered. And if we can't get to a particular question during this session, we'll make sure we uh, follow up with you after. Um, and we'll be sending out a brief survey afterward as well. So if you want to throw any questions and your responses there, are perfectly welcome to. Or, of course, you can always just email or call us. All right, and without further ado, let's talk about the new stuff in 11.1, .1, which is probably why everyone's here. So this is probably the biggest new feature, which is the new completely revamped dashboard. And this is the first and really what's a planned series of changes to the dashboard. So I'm, I'm not sure if everyone had seen the previous dashboard GUI, which was a, a Windows tool that would allow you to do licensing, start and stop services, view some logs, and that kind of thing. We've replaced it entirely with this web-based interface. As you can see here, we can access this dashboard through a web browser and get access to a lot of different features. 
So obviously it's going to be uh, able to work on both Windows and Linux and really any, I mean, Mac OS, your smartphone, whatever. If you've got a web browser, you can access this thing, um, which is going to be, I think, really useful to support a wider variety of configurations and customers. So it's going to kind of also, by the way, the way it works is it's going to merge the existing Lumenvox manager service with that um, prior standalone dashboard tool. So now when you install the, the, the Lumenvox manager service, it'll also act as a web server to host the interface to the dashboard. So you'll be connecting to the manager and then have access to do things like your licensing, to start and stop the Lumenvox services, to make configuration changes, and to view logs and statistics. So on Windows, the way that you're going to get it is we've added a new Lumenvox tools installation package that didn't previously exist. Previously, the manager software was installed with the engine package on Windows, um, which meant that if you were using, say, just the, the TTS server on Windows or something, you'd also install the engine to get um, <laughs> the dashboard manager functionality. Um, so we've kind of split that out to make it a little bit easier for people who are just using one piece to not have to install a bunch of software they don't need. So if you install the Linux tools package, you'll get the manager which provides the dashboard. Then on Linux, it's still included as it always has been with the Lumenvox core package. So that means um, virtually everyone on Linux will, will have the manager installed. I um, can go ahead and turn it on and activate the dashboard functionality. The manager configuration file, which has, again, existed previously, but has a bunch of new additions to it to support this new functionality, is where you'll go to configure the settings related to the dashboard. Um, and we've really put a lot of work into making sure that this is a flexible tool that can be used in a lot of different environments. So you can configure the port that it listens on. By default, it's going to be 8080. You can enable or disable authentication. And again, we've put a lot of work to make sure that it's uh, very secure, can be used regardless of whether you have a PCI compliant environment or other kind of security restrictions. So you can turn on user authentication. You can also, by default, we have um, the service exposed via HTTPS. And you can provide your own SSL certificate if you'd like as well. Um, you can enable or disable both of those functions. So if, you, if you've got it already behind a secure setup and you don't want to bother with HTTPS and SSL and you don't care about user authentication, you can just go ahead and expose it all as a regular web service. And there's a variety of other configuration options, which are all documented in the manager configuration uh, documentation online. And again, we'll be sending everyone a copy of these slides in PDF form, so you can click on these links. And of course, all the documentation is currently live in the knowledge base. One of the nice features about the dashboard is we know licensing is a problem for people, especially for new users. So we've tried to make it really friendly to get through the licensing process. So everything that you could previously do through the old Windows uh, GUI dashboard, you can do this way in terms of licensing through the new web dashboard, as well as anything that you could do through the command line licensing utilities that Linux users are probably familiar with. So you can go ahead and view what licenses are installed on a machine. You can create your server ID, that info.bts file. You can install licenses, uninstall licenses, renew licenses once you've updated software maintenance. And there's an easy button you can click that'll take you right to the lumenvox.com um, licensing web portal. Um, and if you do still prefer to use the command line tools, by the way, we've left all of those in place and intact. Um, so especially for Linux users who might be a little bit more comfortable just SSHing in and using a command line to do all of this, we're not uh, taking away any of that functionality. So just providing multiple paths for people who prefer the GUI management, uh, this is probably a nice, easy solution. One thing you can do through the dashboard that's really cool is actually edit all the configuration options that are available in a configuration file. So for instance, you can see here in this screen, I've got the media server configuration up. So I can go ahead and those are all of the parameters that are available in the media server configuration. You can go and edit them. You can see, I don't know if you can read it, it might be a little bit small, but you can, there's a description of what each setting does, tells you the default, provides you a uh, way to change it, and for certain, for certain things you can even just see a drop down, it's just a list of ranges, thus making it, you know, you can't give it a nonsense, <laughs> invalid setting for some of these, which can be helpful. You can also just, at the bottom of that screen, I'm not showing it there, but you can go ahead and just stop and restart the service. Um, so if you make some changes through the configuration, you can just go to here and click a single button to get those changes applied. The one caveat is um, client property config files are not currently available through the dashboard. And the reason for that is you might very well have multiple client property configuration files on a single machine. For instance, on Windows, if you have our media server installed and our speech tuner installed on, on, a, on the same machine, 
both of them have their own client property config file. So just for simplicity's sake, for this first release, we haven't exposed editing client property config files. It's something we have talked about internally for maybe a future release, um, but for right now, we're just going ahead and not exposing those. So you can still edit those using a text editor like you always could, and of course, the configuration files still live on disk. So if you, again, prefer to use a command line tool or your text editor of choice to edit config files, that's still an option for you. Another great feature of the dashboard is the ability to go ahead and view um, many of the application logs through the dashboard. So as you can see here, I'm looking at the TTS server log, and I have tabs at the top of the screen that will let me um, look at the application log, the startup log, and the critical log. So those are context sensitive. Because um, different uh, services have different logs associated with them, you know, for instance, the media server has different logs than the ASR server, um, those tabs up there are uh, application or service specific, so they'll kind of change depending on which service you're looking at. So you, you can kind of get uh, access to a bunch of logs really quickly. It can be really nice for just having to dig through a couple different directories to find the logs. Um, and it provides a nice, you know, broken down and into nice, easily readable format. You've got a date stamp down one side. You've got a nice uh, column that tells you at a glance, is this message informational? Is it a critical error? Is it a debug message, et cetera? all kind of broken out for you, as well as a, a simple uh, you know, the message itself. So again, another way you can get a single point of management to look at all of your LumenVox services and see how they're running. We do plan to add new enhancements to the dashboard over time, and so this is obviously the first release of this version of the dashboard, so we'd really welcome any feedback you've had once you've had a chance to use it. Um, we will be sending out a survey after this webinar, so one of the questions in there is if you have any ideas for the dashboard, please let us know. Don't uh, hesitate to fill that out. And if you, uh, you know, don't want to answer right now, maybe you want some time to use it, feel free. Always just send an email to uh, Lumenvox support, that's support at lumenvox.com, and let us know if you've got any good ideas for how you would like it to behave in the future. Okay, uh, a couple of other enhancements this time out. Um, one of the, the big ones that we've worked on is the ability to use SIP using TCP in the media server. So um, SIP is the session protocol that MRCP version 2 uses. So in MRCP version 1, the session protocol is RTSP. And prior to 11.1, so 11.0 and earlier, we only supported SIP over UDP instead of over TCP. So for most users, this probably isn't going to be a major change, but it does ensure um, better compliance with some voice platforms out there and make sure that going forward any new voice platforms regardless of whether or not they've implemented SIP over TCP or UDP, uh, we can use their MRCBV2 implementations. So by default now, um, we will, the media server listens on uh, port 5060, so you can always change that, of course, and it will allow both incoming TCP and UDP connections. So if anyone has a voice platform out there that supports MRCBV2, but only over TCP, um, you can now go ahead and previously you might have had to use MRCPV1, now you should be able to use MRCPV2 as well, which does provide some more flexibility for people. And then like Jeff mentioned at the start, we wanted to call out a couple of changes to default behaviors. These will again uh, affect MRCP users, so we'll talk about them both in some detail. Uh, the first change we'll be talking about is that the LumenVox media server will no longer send trying messages in response to SIP invites over MRCPV2. Obviously, there are no SIP invites in MRCPV1. Um, and then also, we're going to change the default behavior of input timers over both versions of MRCP, which definitely bears some discussion. So in a normal SIP call, the, the calling party usually sends an invite message to establish a session. That's how you set up a, a SIP session with an invite. And then the other side can send a, a SIP trying message indicate that it's indicating that it's trying to locate the person that's being called. Once the session is established, it sends back an OK message saying, OK, we've got the session created. So the LumenVox media server had followed this behavior previously. We would receive the invite, send a trying message, and then send an OK message. But the reality is it doesn't really make a ton of sense for us to send a trying message because we're not trying anyone. <laughs> the media server is not talking to anyone else. It's simply um, going to go ahead and immediately connect to our ASR and TTS servers. Um, to establish whatever sort of resources are needed for the session. So we found that this is kind of just generating unnecessary network traffic and putting unnecessary uh, load on the CPU to have to generate these responses, especially because if you looked at them, 
we would be sending the okay, you know, usually within milliseconds of sending the trying. So it just seemed wasteful. Um, and as part of our continued efforts to improve performance under heavy loads, we uh, wanted to go ahead and remove any extraneous messages, and this seemed like a, a good candidate. So we, we've done tests with this. We don't think this actually should affect, uh, hopefully anyone should even notice, because, because platforms shouldn't be requiring a trying message. But just in case you have an MRCPV2 platform that for some reason does expect this trying message, you can re-enable the old behavior by just changing the send SIP trying parameter in the media server configuration file to one. So this is a new uh, configuration parameter that's been added in 11.1, .1, and it's going to default to zero. You can set it to one to get the old behavior back. Probably of greater concern to MRCP users is the change to the input timer. So in both versions of MRCP, there's a concept of an input timer once a recognize starts. So the voice platform sends a recognize command that tells the media server and the ASR to start listening for input, either speech or DTMF. And there is an input timer that's usually defined that specifies the amount of time after the recognize begins before the user has to either start speaking or start inputting DTMF key presses before we return a no input event. Now, um, platforms can control precisely when that begins. It's, it's very common in applications to play out a prompt as part of a recognize because you're going to allow barge in but not actually send an input timer message until after the prompt finishes playing. Because you, if, if imagine that you wanted to have a five second no input after the prompt finished. You know, if you set it to five seconds, as soon as you began playing the prompt and allowing barge in, the no input might trigger before the prompt finished, which would not be great. So what's common behavior is for voice platforms to send a recognized message, keep the input timers to false, so don't turn the input timers on yet, and then after the prompt is finished playing, send a separate start input timer message. So anyway, um, that's a little bit complicated, but it, it, it is how it works. And there's two different, in um, MRCPV1, the message that the voice platform would send is recognize your start timers, and MRCPV2, the start input timers message, but they're both basically the same. So you say, start it true or false when the recognize session begins. Prior to 11.1, LumenVox defaulted the behavior of the recognizer timer to false. So we wouldn't turn on the recognize timer um, by default unless we got a second message telling us to start it, or in, unless the recognized message itself contains start input timers true. But uh, upon review of the MRCP specification, we believe we should have been defaulting this behavior to true, so that's the change we've made in 11.1. .1. Uh, our experience is the vast majority of voice platforms and applications out there explicitly set this anyway. Um, that's kind of been what I've noticed, certainly. So I'm not sure that changing the fault will actually have a ton of impact on users. But we want to make sure we call this one out because it could. So the behavior you, you might see if, if you would be affected by this change is you would start getting no input events when you didn't expect them. So if that's the behavior you see after upgrading to 11.1, .1, you may want to go ahead and try adding the recognizer start timer um, in the media server configuration file. So it's a parameter you have to add in the MRCP section. And to get the old behavior, you'd set it to false. So right now, it's going to default to true. Again, I don't think that'll actually affect a ton of people, but just in case, um, there it is. And we've also added some more TTS voices. We're always working on improving our support for um, TTS. Um, these are two new Welsh voices. So we've got Gavin, he's a male, and Gwendolyn, who is a female voice. And these are actually unique among the Linvox voices uh, because they can speak two different languages. So the rest of our TTS voices sort of speak a single language. If you specify that you want to use the Lindsay TTS voice, you will get um, US English because Lindsay only speaks US English. With these two new voices, they can actually speak both the Welsh language, but they can also speak British English with a Welsh accent, which kind of makes sense given you know the, the, the preponderance of English speakers in Wales. So that, that kind of flexibility means if you're using these voices, you want to be sure that you specify the language along with the voice name when you use them. So if you're using an SSML document and you say voice equals Gwendolyn, it would be a good idea to also uh, explicitly set the language. By default, if you don't specify a language for either one of these, we'll assume that you mean British English. And that's actually going to just follow our standard um, language priority 
selection in the text-to-speech uh, module, which, which we have documented in the knowledge base. Basically, there's a list of priorities, and if we, if we don't know which language to use, we'll, we'll take the top one that we find in our list. So British English has higher priority than Welsh. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the Q&A. If anyone have any questions, feel free to um, submit them to the questions panel. I know it's not a, a ton of complex changes this time, um, but happy to take anything if anyone has anything. And uh, we have the Q&A uh, queue ready for you. A reminder for you, most of you are familiar with this, uh, it is necessary in order to upgrade an existing Lumenbox installation from a prior version to the new 11.1 that the license is for that particular installation be under current maintenance. So uh, reminder, you can check the maintenance dates on those and if you're uh, not current and need the new version functionality, you can uh, address that with your sales team basically at Lumenbox or online at our uh, web portal. All right, and I, I just saw a question come in, uh, whether or not we've improved support for grammars hosted on IIS. And the answer to that question is yes, actually. We, we did have an issue in 11.0 with grammar caching and the way we interface with IIS. Uh, we have since uh, fixed that. That's part of the changes that's gone into 11.1. So yeah, we will be able to better support grammar caching, uh, or HTTP caching, I should say on grammars that are hosted by IIS. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. I don't know, Jeff, do you want to wait a few more moments or just wrap things up here? You know, I think we can let everybody have 30 minutes of their day back and uh, we'll keep this <laughs> short and crisp. I, uh, I think since we'll it's Friday. It Friday afternoon? Yep, I think so indeed. Um, I'd like to thank each of you very much for joining us uh, today. Hope it's been useful information. As Stephen mentioned, we're going to send out a survey momentarily when the webcast ends. We'd appreciate your feedback on all of the questions there, uh, especially around the new uh, dashboard and any additional functionality that you'd like to see exposed in that area. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the webcast, the new product is available on our website today for download. All of the updates have been added to the uh, knowledge base and the uh, web store has been enabled for the new voices. So we are fully operational for 11.1 .1 as of today. Thanks very much for attending. Uh, if you have any further questions or need any additional information, feel free to contact us via email using our support at lemonbox.com address or our new, or not new, our phone number, which is 858-707-7700 and just ask for support. Uh, thanks very much. Have a great day and a great weekend. And we appreciate your business from here at Lemonbox. <laughs>